Hello, in this talk I want to introduce the often initially confusing topics of imaginary and complex frequencies. I'll start with a quick revision of what I mean by a negative frequency. Now, in real life, a negative frequency doesn't make a lot of sense. You can't sing a note of minus 300 hertz, for example. And that's because when you're singing, you're producing a real oscillation of real air molecules. However, the oscillations that we're talking about when we're using phasor representations and complex impedances are not real oscillations. They're complex oscillations. They exist in the complex plane. For example, if you have an Argand diagram with the real part here and the imaginary part here, then any complex number can be represented in polar form in terms of its magnitude, its distance from the origin, a, and its phase angle, theta, in the form a e to the power of j theta. Now, if theta is not constant, but is perhaps a linear function of time, so that theta equals omega t, we could write this complex number, which would now be moving as its position is a function of time, as a e to the j omega t. Now, its amplitude is always a, so its distance from the origin is always a, but its phase angle is now linearly increasing with time. So, that means that this point here would be moving around the origin in an anti-clockwise direction, like so. And that would be a positive frequency of a complex oscillation. A negative frequency would just mean that the phase angle was decreasing with time, so that the oscillation would be just going round the other way. As time increases, the angle decreases. And now we have a complex variable which is going round the grand diagram clockwise. That's what we mean by a negative frequency. Now, you may have noticed something rather odd about poles and zeros. They have the dimensions of frequency. They have to because we express them in terms 1 plus j omega over minus z, for example, as the contribution of a zero to the frequency response. And if we're going to add this term to one, then this term cannot have any units. One doesn't have any units, and you can only add two quantities if they have the same units. Well, j omega has units of frequency, radians per second in this case, so z must have units of radians per second as well. So z is a frequency. Right, what frequency? Well, at the zero, this term here would evaluate to zero, which means that j omega must be equal to z, so that j omega over minus z is minus one, and the whole term evaluates to zero. One plus minus one is zero. And this means that omega is z over j, or minus j times z. So that is the frequency of the zero. It's imaginary. What does that mean? The negative frequency just goes round clockwise. But what does an imaginary frequency do? Well, we can go back to this expression here and have a complex number z given by a e to the j theta. If theta is a complex frequency, then I could write it as, say, j nu times t, just replacing the omega in this expression with the imaginary term j nu. Substitute that into here, and I would get a times e to the j, j nu t. j squared is minus 1, so that would be a e to the minus nu t. That's not an oscillation. This is a perfectly real function, 
which starts at time t equals 0 at 1, and then decays down to 0. It looks like this. With time. We've seen this kind of thing before. It's the capacitor discharge characteristic. It has a time constant associated with it. The time constant being the amount of time it takes for the amplitude to drop by a factor of 1 over e. And that's a better way to think about the effect of poles and zeros. Yes, in terms of units, they are expressed in terms of frequency. But it's not really a frequency. It's better to think about them in terms of 1 over time, where the time is a time constant. Now this is the third use of complex numbers that we've come across so far. Phasers were a way to represent real oscillations using complex numbers. Complex impedance was a way of representing the impedance of resistors, capacitors and inductors using complex numbers. This is a way to represent both an oscillation in terms of a periodic waveform and a rate of growth or contraction, the way the waveform increases or decreases with time, using a complex number. This is a very useful and important technique, a means of representing both a periodic oscillation and a growth or contraction of that oscillation using complex numbers. It's something called the S-plane, and you'll be finding out a lot more about this later on. We're using these complex numbers, s, which is, I'll split that up into sigma, that's the real part of s, and omega, that's the imaginary part of s, so that in general, my complex quantity, z of t, function of time, is the amplitude at time t equals zero times e to the power of st. And I can substitute in from this expression here and write that as a times e to the power of sigma t times e to the power of j omega t. Well, that is the complex oscillation that we've seen before. This is something that affects the magnitude as a function of time and makes the amplitude of the oscillation either grow if sigma is positive or shrink if sigma is negative. A few examples. If I have a S plane here, that's the plane on which I write these complex frequencies. If I had a complex frequency at that point there, then sigma, that's the real part, would be zero. J omega would be positive. I would have something of the form A e to the J omega t. And if I plotted how that behaved as a function of time, that would be an oscillation that went round anti-clockwise. A frequency, a complex frequency down here, would have a negative imaginary part, but still sigma would be zero, because the real component is zero. So that would be a negative frequency oscillation, it would just be going around clockwise. Something back there, however, has a zero imaginary part because it's on the real axis, but it has a negative value of sigma. So that would just produce something of the form a e to the sigma t, where sigma is negative. So if that started here, it would just do this. and decay towards the origin in time, as long as sigma was negative, which it is, if the point is back here. So, what about a point there? It has an imaginary part, and it has a negative real part. So this is going to be an oscillation which decays in amplitude as a function of time. This would be doing something like this. 
and spiralling into the origin. If something was over here, it would have a positive real part, which means it would be getting bigger and bigger um, and eventually blow up. We don't usually see those things. That's the reason that most of our poles and zeros that we see in the real world are on the negative side of the y-axis. They have a negative real part. That was a very quick introduction to the idea of complex frequencies and the s-plane. I won't be saying a lot more about it in this module, but you will find out much more about it later on.